Okay. Hello, I'm Avram Friedman, and this is News from the Roots. Welcome back. I have some special guests on um, this this morning. Uh, my son Zev Friedman and Courtney Brook uh, from Earth Haven. They live in Earth Haven, which uh, we consider part of Western North Carolina, <laughs> at least for the purposes of this show. It's a sovereign nation, right. actually. <laughs> <laughs> and often, I, I have to say that when I go into Asheville. Um, and I introduce myself to someone new, they say, oh, you're Zev's dad. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and so uh, Zev does have a, a reputation. I imagine Courtney, Courtney does as well. And um, we would like to uh, ask you this morning to tell us a little bit about what you're doing, uh, the many things that you're both doing, uh, uh, including uh, what life is like at Earth Haven, what is Earth Haven, uh, give us a little history there, if you will. Mm. Shall I go first? Yeah, go. Okay. So, Earth Haven is a, an intentional community that was started back in 1995. The land was purchased in 1994. And it was conceived as, a, as an educational community whose mission had to do with developing a living laboratory for a sustainable human future, whatever that means. And it means a lot of different things to a lot of different people, it turns out. Is that the actual mission statement? Yeah, I can't quote the mission statement, but it contains that phrase. Yeah. It's a living laboratory and seed bank for a sustainable human future, I think is, okay. is, is part of the mission statement. And then there are a bunch of sub goals to that too. So it was, it was founded by this group of 12 people who, who looked at hundreds of pieces of property around Western North Carolina. And there's a whole beautiful story to how all of that happened. And people had dreams and visions and hopes that all coincided upon this eventual outcome of buying the Earth Haven property, which was 320 acres to begin with. And, and land was more affordable then back in, uh, in 1995 and, and in Northern Rutherford County, which is where the property is located. And it's been now um, a part of the eco-village movement, which itself is a permaculture-based movement. Um, and permaculture is, is a global practice and community that has to do with designing for sustainable human settlements and human um, uh, other needs in an integrated way. And so I've been living at Earth even for just over four years. I've had not at all been there since the beginning. Um, but I'm, I'm an educator there, a permaculture educator, and a farmer, and I do um, permaculture design and consulting for landowners, people around the region who want to start up small or large similar projects to Earth even. And we live off the grid, so all the electricity is coming from solar and micro hydro with a little backup from gas-powered generators when there's not enough sun for days at a time. And most of the buildings are built from wood that people chopped the trees down and milled them and built the buildings on the land. And we grow a lot of food and have little schools for the children and different kinds of community events and celebrations. And, uh, and it's all based around inviting other people from the public to come and participate and then take home seeds to their own lives of how to, to, to carry out things related to this in their own ways and unique situations. So, so yeah. Earth Haven, do you have anything to add to that, Courtney? Um, you go ahead and ask the question. Well, uh, it's, I didn't realize 1995 is when Earth Haven started. That's 22 years ago. Yeah. That, that's, that's quite a long time. Yeah. I think you'd, we'd have to label that as a success. A success. In terms of yeah the sustainability of that community. I know yeah. I, I was raised, you know, uh, well, I was born in 1950, and in the 1960s, of course, there was this back-to-the-land movement, uh, and many thousands of communities started all over, right. uh, specifically in, in, the, in the Pacific Northwest and, and in, um, the, Northeast. in the Northeast as yeah. well, in Vermont and Maine and New yeah. Hampshire upstate New York and and somewhat in the southwest as well and, and, and to some degree all over the country. Well, right, there was the Mother Earth News that eco village right, right here in North Carolina. It wasn't really an intentional community, that was more of a business, but but um, yes, and, uh, but those uh, 
Many very often, flopped, for the yeah. most part, were very short-lived yeah. and uh, transient. And this seems to be a more serious, um, long-term venture yeah. to me. And wh what do you uh, attribute that to? Yeah, well, uh, just because I've been there longer, you know, can I speak to yeah, that yeah. also? <laughs> yeah. Well, it's interesting because there's a woman named Diana Leaf Christian who lives at Earth Haven who literally wrote the book on starting intentional communities called Creating a Life Together. Hmm. Um, and she has been at Earth Haven, I think, for 15 or 17 years. And she travels around the world studying intentional communities and, uh, and teaching about how to start them and how to be successful at them. And she says that 90% of attempted intentional communities fail within the first 10 years mm -hmm. and that she's distilled out two commonalities between the ones that seem to most most frequently succeed and they they have one or two of these things one of them is a shared economic base at a community where it's a shared business or set of businesses that ties everybody together into a common financial destiny and interdependence and two is a shared um, deep belief system or spiritual practice and um, so like a, a religion or some other type of shared belief system or spiritual practice and she says if a community doesn't have at least one of those it's almost certain to fail within 10 years the interesting thing about earth haven is that it kind of has both has both of those but doesn't really have either <laughs> yeah. and what i mean is that it's there there are several businesses on the land that people on the land work for on the, on the, in, on the property. Um, and there have been others in the past, but not everybody is can required you, to work for them. Can you name some of those businesses? Yeah, there's Useful Plants Nursery is, mm -hmm. the, is the biggest employer right now. Red Moon Herbs, which is a herbal production company, was founded there and lived there for a long time until it just moved, it was sold to another, another owner who, who moved it off of the Earth Haven property just three years ago. Um, and then there was the Earth Even Forestry Co-op, which was the most the most expansive business, and that employed I think ten people full time at its height. And that was um, people were doing um, sustainable uh, um, felling of trees on 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 the land in kind of selective logging projects, taking the trees out, milling them, and building houses. That whole supply chain, um, and that was great. It built that successfully built a lot of the um, buildings at Earth even and did a lot of the clearings. Um, and then I have a business there, my permaculture design business. We have Soil, the School of Integrated Living, which is an educational business at Earth even that does most of the educational programming there. Um, are there others that I'm missing? Culture's Edge. Culture's Edge, which is also an educational and event coordination mm. business. It's actually a nonprofit organization, Culture's Edge is. Um, so yeah, that's kind Yellow of Yellow Root Farm. Yellow Root Farm is a is a biodynamic farm. There, bread and butter dairy is a is a um, pastured dairy operation with with cows and and chickens and pigs, moving them in integrated pasturing systems and selling meat and dairy products and chicken and eggs and um, so and then there was there was um, there's a whole vision for there's a building that's it's still in process called the. The Village Arts Building, which is a giant timber-framed building that would house artists and craftspeople's studios to make all kinds of products from, especially wood, from the property. Because that was one of the things that they assessed in the early days, is what do we have lots of? Wood. <laughs> and they said we should start some, some businesses and based on so wood products. A, yeah. It's, I believe it's, it's a rule at Earth Haven, right, that any structure that's built has to be built from materials on the land? Mm -hmm. Is that not true? Mm -hmm. Okay, my mistake. It's not. Um, most people aspire to do so, and most of the buildings are built from where the, where the, where the wood is from the land, but... What about the Waddle and Daub uh, buildings, the, uh, you know, sort of adobe-like structures, which are beautiful? Yeah. I mean, from what I've seen, the, these are pretty much modern buildings. The, these are, this is not just uh, shacks in the woods. The, the, they're quite elaborate, the, the buildings I've seen, and, and they're comfortable to live in and, and clean and... Um, you know, I, I mean, they even meet 
building standards to some degree. <laughs> yeah, let's go ahead and say that. Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, there's a I'd say there's a spectrum of building styles and mm -hmm. modernity at Earth even. Everything from very primitive things that are not actually uh, living structures. Like teepees and such. Right? Yeah, to all the way to um, coded very engineered buildings that have more elaborate heat circulation systems and yeah. so forth, but yeah. So, so let me ask you, what led you uh, to want to join a community like this? Uh, Courtney, maybe yeah. you can, you know, what in your, just tell us about your life leading up to joining Earth Haven and why you wanted to live in a place like that finally. Well, I grew up in a group setting on my family farm. We had a five generation family farm in North Georgia, which was like an intentional community, although it was just our family growing food together and living on land together. And at any time there was between 30 and 50 of us there. And, and where, where was it? In, in North Georgia in Mount Airy, just okay. about um, mm -hmm. 20 minutes south of Tulu Gorge. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that ended in my childhood. And then I lived with my parents, my mom and my stepdad in like a nuclear family house for a while. And that was weird to me, you know, <laughs> to, to just live like that. I was an only child. And so then after that, since I've moved out of my parents' house, I've, I've always lived in co-housing setting mm -hmm. because it's to, to have a kitchen that's alive, the way I want to have a kitchen that's alive, it takes more than one or two or three people to keep that going. Mm -hmm and um, to grow food together. Like, I love gardening, but I really don't like gardening by myself. Mm. And so to have, to have all those systems working smoothly, it's too much for one person. It's too much for two people. So, so in your mm -hmm. early childhood, you, you grew up in a, a communal situation? I, I mean, w what was the background of that? Well, it was our family. It mm -hmm. was five generations of our family. So it was my great-grandparents' place and my great-grandparents, my great-great-grandparents' place. My great-grandparents were still alive and then their kids as well, and then all of us, and then all of our cousins. So I had 21 first cousins on that mm -hmm. side. And yeah, so we all lived there together. And it was tied together by both economic um, interdependence, because we were growing all of our food together, and even sometimes income sharing. So just to be clear, I mean, this is not really a unique situation. There were other families doing the same thing nearby. I mean, that's how Americans lived at one time. Yeah, and it's kind of <laughs> this gone is a out very of style. American institution. Were there a lot of other clans like that at that time? Like not around? really. Like yeah. ours kind of hung on for a while longer, and I and I think it also had to do with with um, the second thing you said, which was sharing spirituality. Mm. And that's what tied us together. Like the church was on our place, and that that held the whole thing together. Yeah. Um, yeah. No, and I got. I think I got really lucky to grow up like that and to know that sort of that sort of interdependent way of living. And then I went, I, had, I lost that. Like, it's not there anymore. It was just me and dad for a while. Yeah. And that's hard. It was just two of us, and it was too much. And so um, then I've been living for the past five years in New Zealand with my um, working and studying with my colleague and mentor, Rubina McCurdy, who does a lot of work in intentional communities, all in eco-villages all around the world. And so I've been living at this eco village that she started for the past few years called Tui Community in the top of the South Island of New Zealand. Oh, wow. Yeah. And so that's when I really came back to living in that way and like intentional land sharing. But it's a it's a tricky puzzle because it's way different from growing up with your family. Yeah. Or it's like obviously if your grandma says so, then it's so. Right. No. <laughs> well, this, this, is, this is fascinating to me because, I mean, it's something that I think most people who live in America don't realize, but the way we're living now in nuclear families and separate households is really the anomaly. Yeah. It's the, Absolutely. for thousands of years, people lived in clans, clans sure. tribalistically, yeah. communal kitchens, as you say, where, yeah. where there's people working together in the kitchen, in yeah. the field. You know, and and working yeah. to, together. That's how kids are learning as, and as being a, cared a, for. A large yeah. extended family, and then maybe in the last fifty or seventy-five years, or that kind of exploded with the industrial revolution, and families breaking apart and and moving all over. You know, the automobile and the airplane had a lot to do with that, making it easy for people to travel and go to jobs in other parts yeah. of the country, and and just 
split up families and then each little unit was on its own and I think maybe that's becoming economically untenable right now that uh, you know with the cost of housing and um, and the limitation of jobs and to a certain degree of living wage jobs um, people are beginning to understand perhaps that that doesn't work you know no. uh, ultimately maybe for a little while uh, yeah. the petroleum economy right. allowed yeah. that to happen right. because we were uh, disproportionately wealthy as right. a nation and that there was a distribution of wealth that allowed that to take place in almost an unnatural way and now that things are getting tight again you know um, people are beginning to experiment with coming back together sure. maybe not as families sure. with, with as blood families as it used to be sure. but but just out of economic necessity huh. And environmental necessity, and you know, um, oh, and, and social, purpose, sense of purpose, social, yeah. yes, yeah. and uh, we're beginning to realize that we have to live a little bit differently than the industrial revolution has led us to live yeah. in, and 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 Earth Haven is an example of of that metamorphosis back yeah. to uh, living in larger extended families. Mm -hmm. I think it's interesting how sometimes people have this um, perception that it's it's going to be will, really easy and you're going to have a lot of time when you're living <laughs> like that. But actually, it's not. Like there, people's schedules are full yeah. all the time. But people's schedules are full all the time you anyway. You have a board, right? <laughs> yeah. And yeah. then and then it's like, but instead of of going grocery shopping by yourself and going to your job by yourself and and taking your kids to soccer and and all these things. It's like, well, I'm gardening with my, I'm still gardening. I'm still having to do things. It's still a full schedule, but it's layered in with, with social capital and you're inter interacting with mm. your friends yeah. all the time when you're doing everything right. and you're building these like deep relationship ties while you're cooking and while you're watching the kids and while you're weeding the garden and while you're or running a business or having meetings or yeah, yeah, right. mm -hmm. yeah, that's right. Yeah. And, and I mean it. You know, there's an epidemic of depression in our society mm. and so the basic premise that a consumer society that allows everyone to have their own little kingdom their own little suburban kingdom and control their own little things that that's going to actually bring happiness and satisfaction and a good life I think is disproven mm. the the proof is not in the pudding the pudding if the put if the if the pudding were the happiness dis, the disproof is in the pudding <laughs> yeah and and I think I, I think as much as there are kind of rational reasons of energy efficiency and shared infrastructure and functionality of living in the community there are also emotional and spiritual and relational motives for doing that and that people we we are social animals we did come from actually hundreds of thousands of years of communal living right. as a species and and like you said just so recently have we come up with this industrial device of fragmenting ourselves off and in a lot of ways that was by design you can look at the history of uh, going back into the um the british division of the commons which was a deliberate strategy by the aristocracy to break up land-based communities and disempower them so the aristocracy could take the land mm. and also force people into the cities to work in factory jobs for industrial revolution motives mm. and that was a deliberate sustained campaign that's still happening in the world mm. still being done to indigenous land-based communities yeah why don't you go out and get a job <laughs> yeah, but like, like Courtney said to me the other day, she's like, my family didn't think of ourselves as poor right. until, right, you were telling me that, I forget how you said it, but it was like... Until I went to school. Until you went to school. And then I was like, oh. We're poor. Yeah. Right? It's like, because poor means growing your own food, cooking it all together, eating communal meals, fixing your own stuff, making well, your own stuff. Poor basically not having a lot of money. Exactly. Well, but, <laughs> right, what, yeah. but, but poor has other associations in our, in our culture. It means not being able to meet your needs. Right. right but that actually there are other ways of meeting needs too and that but once we're broken down out of community the only way to meet basic needs like health care food housing companionship etc is through money mm -hmm. and so money has replaced the ability of human communities to meet 
needs through a non-monetary Forget transaction. Money is a representation of something. Right. It isn't something in itself right. other than the paper that it's printed on. Yeah. Um, and I think, you know, even my family is just one small example of something that's happened all over the place. But it's like my dad and I wanted to buy our family land because when it was owned by a lot of our family, then my grandmother died. And so we had to all make a decision what was going to happen. And my dad and I wanted to buy it. And it was just this whole clashing of ideas mm -hmm. where it was like, well, but, but farming, whatever that even means, growing food and living on a piece of land is is only if you can't afford something else right. with that money. Was, the, the rest of your family that was the, That was what, you know, um, our, my and my dad's ideas clashing up against the rest of our family's ideas about what it means to be mm. poor or yeah. not. Right. And we're like, no, no, we're rich. We're actually, if we, we have, have the beautiful land. land yeah. And, right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's like the good earth. <laughs> have you ever read the good earth? It's in China? In That's it. Right. Oh, yeah. I yeah. did read that. I remember that theme yeah. though, but father's dying words were, the, you know, don't, uh, don't sell the land. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so, so let's let's talk a little bit about now on the other end. Uh, okay, so what do we build from here? I, and I know what what your uh, primary word is is permaculture. Is, I would say, uh, and and mm -hmm. all that encompasses. So tell us about how you became involved in permaculture. What, what is permaculture and, and how that is evolving and um, what it encompasses? Do you want to go first? Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. Um, I first got involved in permaculture, in, in what is, we're calling permaculture. That word came to me mm -hmm. um, when I started working with Earth Care Education Aotearoa in New Zealand with Rubina McCurdy. It's her uh, educational trust and do a lot of earth-based education. So just anything that has to do with people living together and living back on land, mm -hmm. people taking care of people and taking care of earth and, and living inside whole systems is really what that's all about. And that is permaculture. And it's a hard thing to sort of, in the beginning when you're learning about it, it's a hard thing to point at and say that thing is permaculture. Right. Because it was a movement that was started several decades ago mm -hmm. by you know, yeah, sometimes people point at it and say it was started several decades ago by two Australian men, David Holmgren and Bill Mollison. But they're, they were actually saying, how do we steward land in a way that's working and is sensible? So they were actually looking at things that were very old mm -hmm. to come up with this new concept called permaculture, and um, which is now kind of defined as a design science, a, um, a system of design that is considering people and earth and fair distribution so that of, of resources and, and energy. And sustainability, I think, is, all, is at the basis of permaculture, wouldn't you say? I mean, that depends who you ask. And how you use that word, yeah. Yeah, I, I actually personally don't use that word, sustainability, hmm. because I don't want, I'm not actually interested in sustaining things the way they are right now. I don't want to keep, I want it well, to actually get I, better. When I talk about sustainability, I'm talking about sustainability sustaining life on earth sustaining human life on earth and not using resources more rapidly than they become available so that it is indefinitely sustainable it's not like i don't consider the petroleum economy sustainable because we're going to run out of petroleum oh. you know uh and so i guess that's what i'm talking about when i'm when i'm talking about sustainability and 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 the the concept my first introduction to permaculture was the the notion of growing uh, perennials rather than annuals in the garden because you don't have, when you do that, you don't have to fertilize the soil, you don't have to use insecticides, you, 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 and you're planting something. You only have to plant it once and, and then it will, for decades or <laughs> centuries, uh, provide uh, food for, for you. Uh, you don't have to work the land after, it's, after you've created that environment of of permaculture and that's you know where that's the permanence in permaculture <laughs> uh, but it, of course it has expanded and, and now I understand that it's uh, it has a greater meaning than that. <laughs> yeah well it came from the from the two words permanent agriculture which is very yeah. much that was the idea in yeah. the beginning is like how do we set up food systems that are sensible that are going to be able to sustain human life right. in the long term not not these sort of you know um, petroleum-based annual cropping systems that are we're trying to feed ourselves with now. Right. 
And so that's where it came from, permanent agriculture, and that made permaculture. But now it's really more of this, it's got to do with so many things, right? Because we can't do, we can't do that thing. We can't ha be growing food sustainably if we're not, if we don't have all these other things in place, like systems that are going to take care of people mm -hmm. and systems that are going to, like economic systems that are sensible. So now it's, I, I often hear it referred to just as permanent culture. Like how do we reform the way we're thinking about people and the planet and energy systems so that it can actually be a permanent, a permanent thing. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Were you telling more about your story of how you got or <coughs> involved oh, yeah. in it? Yeah. Um, yeah. So I, so I studied ecology in university and uh, at the Odom School of Ecology in Georgia, in UGA. And it was like... Is that in Athens? Or? Yep, in Athens, Georgia. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. yeah. And it was like all these people who cared so much and were looking into systems that were working called ecosystems, biological systems, and, and trying to make a difference in the world. But, and, they, and they are. But I felt this like tension in myself of going, I don't need to count it anymore to... To, to know about it, you know, and to learn to from it. To measure and count. Yeah, right. to just to quantify the pieces of it and break it down into smaller and smaller parts to understand it. And so it was like how, and so in myself, I felt like how do I, how do I actually learn from it in a holistic way and then, and then try to mimic the pattern mm -hmm. in other systems. And so that's how I was managing land for a while. And so I was working for this woman managing her property when I met Rabina McCurdy who was teaching permaculture and everything that this whole set of, of ideas around permaculture was exactly that. It's like, how do we look at functioning systems called ecosystems and then take the patterns from there as lessons to set up other systems, other economic systems and food producing systems and social systems. And I was like, aha, mm -hmm. here we are. And it's, yeah. So then that's how I got to, this thing called permaculture. <laughs> okay. Yeah. And what led you to Earth Haven? Well, there. So, yeah, yeah. that's a thing. So I, I teach permaculture um, with Earth Care Education with Rubina, and then there's these courses called permaculture design courses, which is sort of how you get a, a basically a big in-depth introduction into this thing called permaculture, which has so many pieces and so many moving parts and so many faces. Mm. And so that's what I do for most of my livelihood is teach PDCs, permaculture design courses. And Earth Haven also has this mission of teaching about permaculture. And so I was teaching, I've been teaching in New Zealand, which is not my bioregion. You know, I'm from the Southeast United States. And right. so I felt that sort of call to come home mm -hmm. and then linked up with Zev and Patricia Allison, who are teaching at Earth Haven and started teaching with them. So where did you two meet? That's she she met. contacted us because she, about wanting to come back to this region and check out the bioregion and teach and permaculture with okay. us. Yeah. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Thank you. Yeah. And, uh, so what about you, Zeb? What, what led you to Earth Haven? From the start? Long and winding road. Well, <laughs> I grew up with these beautiful ecological activist parents here in <laughs> Silva, North Carolina. <laughs> and... Uh, drank it in with my mother's milk, as you might say. <laughs> and, um, and then I, when, it, when I was about 17, I think I started, although I had the values that I had grown up around and in my household with you and mom had been present and were in me. Mom is Jody Freeman. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I hadn't fully adopted them and owned them myself mm -hmm. um, to, 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 to a deep level of action. And so, but then when I was around 17, I started looking around me and really for the first time fully noticing the intricate beauty of the ecosystems around us and life around us and more about, I, was, I started reading more about indigenous cultures and um, and this was after you, you had uh, you'd gone to the School of Science and Math mm -hmm. in, in uh, Durham. Yeah. And then you uh, graduated and started going to uh, UNCA. Well, I took a year off between the two and lived back here in Silva, okay. if you recall. Yeah. 
and was doing a lot of, of hiking and backpacking and spending time out in the woods during that time and especially up in shining rock wilderness area mm -hmm. and which i still go to every year based on our original practice of going up to sam's knob and the mm -hmm. wild blueberry gathering in the summer and um and that's a very interesting place shining rock wilderness because it's an artifact of humans mimicking natural ecosystem patterns just like courtney was speaking to because the high blueberry balds in shining rock are actually maintained through fire and originally that's a pattern that comes from lightning and the higher incidence of lightning strikes on the ridges of mountains that then causes fire which burns down the, the oak trees and the other ridge top trees and allows the blueberries to come up because otherwise the blueberries get shaded out by trees but those balds have been blueberry balds for hundreds of years now because of repeated rounds of fire and then the people just the, hundreds of years maybe well thousands of years <laughs> maybe yeah in yeah. some cases certainly the pattern of blueberry balds in the region is thousands of years old and that particular spot is at least hundreds of years hmm. and um and the people who now we call the cherokee were deliberately burning those balds mimicking the lightning patterns right. to maintain blueberry producing ecosystems and also hunting grounds um, and so that's a really interesting local example of what Courtney's speaking to of of humans mimicking natural ecosystem patterns and then and then becoming part of that and which is really what I think we're aspiring for in permaculture is, is for humans to truly see ourselves as part of ecosystems rather than as these kind of this alien virus <laughs> which is in a lot of ways what the American environmental movement has portrayed and the worldwide mainstream environmental movement often ends up portraying humans as an intrinsically negative force on the planet and that is seen through for instance through the strategies of starting up wilderness areas or national parks which imp imply that we have to actually set aside separate areas that are not for humans to live in because humans are inherently destructive so we have to limit our destructiveness that's the underlying narrative there and so going back to my story then I started to think about to look around see the incredible beauty of the earth and at the same time um, see the level of destruction fully begin to comprehend the level of destruction that we've been causing on the earth to ecosystems and to ourselves and I started to see as I studied it more how hand in hand those things go how you know there's a whole thing called the eco feminism movement which is um, uh, academic description of something that indigenous people already know which is that the assault on the earth is coming from the same same phenomenon in human consciousness that the assault on indigenous people is coming from and the same one that the assault on women and the feminine is coming from that those are all part of the same movement in human consciousness that is attacking the inherent life support systems of the earth and of the feminine and of indigenous earth-based ways it's all the same thing and i started to see that and um and so in the same in the same breath i kind of then went to unca and unc asheville and began studying environmental science which like courtney was saying does a great job at measuring and describing the scope of life's beauty and complexity and also of the loss and the toxicity and measuring the rate of species extinction and so on and those things are all really important i'm really deeply thankful there are people doing those and it was a depressing thing to participate in because any of the solutions that were offered are always high-tech solutions large government scale funded things that oftentimes end up creating as many problems as they solve because they're high-tech solutions that themselves have unintended consequences and so i was studying all of that and then in my sophomore year of college at unca um, someone gave me a copy of Bill Mollison's Permaculture Designer's Manual, which is still one of the big classics really in permaculture, where he lays out the founding um, understandings, historical, ecological understandings, and design system strategies that um, permaculture consists of. And that was so empowering to me because it was actually a, a more in-depth and whole systems assessment of the ecological challenges and social challenges that we face on the planet than anything I'd ever seen or read before. And at the same time, 
a community scale set of approaches to how to heal that. It didn't, that doesn't depend on tens of millions of dollars of EPA funding or whatever. It depends on uh, people acting on a, on a um, family to community scale to change landscapes, provide for our own needs, heal ecological damage, grow new culture, um, and set up better conditions for the future than what we have now. So that, and what Courtney was getting at, I think, is we often use the term regenerative instead of sustainable. It's a little con contrast. And like the way you were using the word sustainable, I agree with that. But a lot of times, the, the way that the EPA defines sustainability is sustainability is not... Economic sustainability. No. Or, well, I don't know about that, but they say the, the literal way they define it is sustainability is... Um, not compromising the fu the, po the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. That's the definition of, of sustainability. Regeneratability, on the other hand, is actually providing, strategizing now to leave our descendants something better than what we have now. Okay. It's like creating topsoil hmm. to, that they can grow things. It's not just saying we're gonna we're gonna not damage things so badly that you can't scrap it together in 100 years. It's actually saying we want to leave things better. We want to leave you pleasant surprises, Building. descendants. Building. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah they, so human beings are not just part of the environment, but but uh, we we help improve the environment. The exactly. Culture, right? you know, just like topsoil was built exactly. up over millions exactly. of years. We right. want to be part of that process of in, right. in, including. And that's a fundamentally different belief system than a lot of what I'm calling mainstream environmentalism comes from, which again, it, mainstream environmentalism, it tends to be like, I, and I love the Sierra Club, and they've done great work, but just to I describe it this way, I call it Sierra Club environmentalism, which is <laughs> preservationism. It, it, it assumes that humans are inherently destructive, and we just have to limit that destructiveness. In permaculture, we try to take it one step further and say, no, actually, that's not inherently true. That is how it's been since the Industrial Revolution, primarily. But it's actually possible to set up human systems, human ecosystems, such that through the very actions of providing for our own needs, we're increasing ecological diversity, increasing topsoil health, sequestering carbon, improving ecosystems, because we are a member of them. And that's a totally different belief system. It still doesn't mean we shouldn't preserve certain especially ecologically sensitive areas from human economy, mm -hmm. but that many types of ecosystems can even be improved mm -hmm. through human interaction. So just to go back a little bit, yeah. can you give us give an example of uh, how uh, you, you had mentioned uh, current solutions sometimes involve technological solutions and that that yeah. uh, that have unintended consequences. Sure. Would you give us an example of that? Hydroelectric power. Okay. Hydroelectric power and building giant dams mm -hmm. allows us to avoid burning coal for electricity. Mm -hmm. right. But it turns out that hydroelectric dams that dam entire river systems interrupt salmon runs and and build up huge loads of toxins on the uphill side of the dam that no one knows what to do with and interrupt migrations of other organisms and water flow downstream um etc cetera, etc cetera. Right. or coal scrubbers so it's really a solution without considering the yeah. entirety of the problem of the system right of the system right, right. and then because and, it is like like courtney was saying you know, permaculture started out permanent agriculture, but quickly got changed to mean permanent culture because the systems we're talking about are not simple, bio, are not even just biophysical systems of energy and water and forests and soil and sun. They're biocultural physical systems where it's all connected to the extent that, for instance, coal burning power plants, right? If, if we might say, well, from a biophysical systems perspective, we should shut down coal burning power plants right now and be generating all our electricity from sun, but then the dimension comes in of employment of human beings, and, ever, and the coal miners say, no, but we need to continue employing humans through to be coal miners and to run coal burning power plants. And now we know that it actually makes more jobs and better jobs to actually build solar mm -hmm. facilities and micro hydro and wind power. Those things actually employ more people in a more distributed fashion too, rather than these dense coal mines, and it's also better for the people. So that starts to be a systemic approach once we bring in the human element and the human needs and say that how that's part of the system, part of that biophysical system needs to be taking care of the humans that are part of it. Right. Yeah. Um, I'm running out of battery. Well, I'm hoping not. 
that might have been my phone. Are your uh, you still have a green light on your? Yep, mic? I do. Good. Okay. Um, well, this is a great discussion. Um, I just talked a lot, so if you want to say anything. Um, you, you go ahead. I, had yeah, yeah, yeah. I lost it. Well, well I, I want to move along to, uh, to something that's happening in a, in a couple of weeks uh, or in a month. Uh, the, the kudzu workshop. Oh. Kudzu, yeah. and, and, and how this uh, fits camp. in. Talk a little bit about that and how this fits into the concept of permaculture and... Uh, I was going to say sustainability, but I'm not going to say that. <laughs> uh, yeah, <laughs> regeneratability. It doesn't, it doesn't roll off the tongue quite the same as sustainability. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, I will, and I also want to make sure that there's time for you to, to interject other things. That to uh -huh. just do it. I, before we talk about the kudzu thing, yeah. this, this will lead right into that. I want, I did want to say about what you were just saying that when we're looking at whole systems and how to actually come up with real solutions that are going to last through time yeah it's i think it's it has to do with with looking when, when i look into an ecosystem it's like I, it's so clear how you can't pull one one string without dismantling the whole thing mm -hmm. right and then but that's not how we have come to look at systems management it's like oh we can we can look at the economic system and and try to solve problems in there and we can look at our agricultural systems try to solve problems in there, but it's like, no, it's all connected. you can't. Yeah. It's all one big, one big web that not only has to do with, with space, that by all these things being connected in the now, but also has to do with time. And that that's, for me, part of permaculture, is that if it's going to be permanent, we have to actually consider time. And that that's been one of these missing pieces. Like, yes, hydroelectric power, for example, <laughs> solve something right now but what about what about through time right and that that piece has gone gone missing sometimes yeah, what about future generations yeah. yeah what about silt build up and and fish migration and, and et cetera et cetera right and so I think for me that's a key thing about permaculture is is how do we do these things through time yeah. which leads to us having actual culture because yeah. that's how things have been carried on through time right. Right, because otherwise one generation figures out how to do something, but then they die without anyone wanting to learn it because there's no culture around it. Mm -hmm. and, these, and these land, right, permaculture is trying to set up land management systems that are managed on the 100 or more year scale. So that's inherently a longer time scale than a human lifespan, and that takes culture to transmit that knowledge of how, and not only the knowledge, but the caring, the desire to manage the systems. It has to be something desirable. It can't be farming corn in Iowa by the 10,000 acres with a tractor, because that's boring. Mm -hmm. No, people, younger generations don't want to do that. Who's gonna carry that on? That's an immediate loss of culture. Mm -hmm. So that's a big part of it, was recognizing that we have to be growing culture that carries the knowledge, the procedural knowledge of how to actually implement these systems or else they're just going to keep flopping and people are going to keep forgetting and having a cycle of generations having to reconstruct a, a regenerative system because they forgot after the last generation died. Mm -hmm. So that's a good segue for Kudzu actually. It's yeah. a great yeah. segue. We have, because we have, we have the website Kudzu Culture dot net um, to learn more about what we're about to talk about which is which is actually growing a, a culture of use and economic value around kudzu not as an incentive to plant more kudzu but actually as a as a mechanism for controlling the spread of kudzu and making it a potentially beneficial member of our southeastern ecosystems instead of a destructive member of the ecosystems and so, you know, when kudzu was brought here in the 1920s, primarily, it was brought to serve functions. It wasn't accidental. It was brought to control the erosion on steep slopes where people had been farming with poor practices and causing lots of erosion or cutting highway cuts and railroad cuts through mountainsides or logging and creating tons of erosion. That was a massive issue. That's what the Civilian Conservation Corps during the Great Depression was formed to deal with was the erosion caused by logging and farming and railroad building practices. And there were teams of thousands and thousands of people working all across the United States doing essentially permaculture, actually funded by the federal government. <laughs> the Civilian Conservation Corps, it's amazing history to look up. If people, viewers want to learn more about that. But um, one of the things they were doing was planting kudzu. 
because it's an extremely effective erosion control plant. It covers the soil and so that when raindrops fall, they hit the leaves and it slows the water down so it doesn't just wash the soil away. And it's a nitrogen fixer. It's in the, in the pea family, so it's improving the soil. Sorry about that. It's okay, I'll wait. Okay, I will turn my phone off. This is the second time that I've done that in the show. <laughs> That's, right. um, That's why you can edit. Well, yeah. <laughs> we'll, see, we'll let people see the real thing. Though. That's right, the real thing. All its warts. <laughs> and, uh, and they also brought it here for livestock fodder because it's higher quality fodder for livestock than alfalfa. It's like 22% protein by dry weight, kudzu leaves. So it's animals love it. I've talked to farmers who are like, they'll their cows will actually go for a bale of kudzu over a bale of alfalfa if they have the choice. Hmm. Um, and so it was brought here for that for those reasons. But then what it, what wasn't brought here was the culture of use from Japan, which is where it's the the most developed economy around kudzu. Where there was literally an economy and an industry around each part of the plant. And it's used for food, yeah. clothing, rope. Yeah. yeah. Uh, medicine, yeah, uh, all of the well, yeah. Which I first learned about growing up with my parents on our property, which is mostly covered in kudzu, and they had this book of kudzu around all the time, which was written by a couple who had traveled to Japan and studied the Japanese traditional His names are economies. <laughs> well, William Shirtliff is the man, and, and and his wife, unfortunately, I cannot remember her name. Yeah. She's Japanese, um, and so. What happened is that, and this is a great illustration of what happens when we don't have culture brought with the, the with the physical techniques, because um, there, kudzu is not at all an invasive plant problem in Japan, mm-hmm. because it has a primary predator, which is human beings. Mm-hmm. Human beings are the primary predator of kudzu so in isn't Japan. So interesting? Yeah. If if you use this plant, right. And have a relationship with it. it. It can bring you tremendous benefit. Uh, and if you don't use it, it can be a tremendous problem. Exactly. And and so uh, it seems to me that the logical thing to do is learn how to use it in right. the United States instead of tr- poisoning ourselves right. to kill it. Instead, we demonize it. And yeah. through calling it a problem, it becomes a problem right. because we don't have a relationship of use and harvesting with it. And so with Kudzu Camp, this is an event that my colleague Justin Holt and I have been doing um, for the past six years. In the winter, we have Kudzu Root Camp at your property right. here in Silva, which is where we, we harvest primarily the roots. And we make the root starch out of it, which is a highly valued food and medicine. Um, and we we make all kinds of beautiful meals and have fires outside and are digging the kudzu and processing and teaching about it and about a permaculture land use system that involves kudzu that we're experimentally developing at your property and, mm-hmm. and want to develop with other people on their kudzu properties in the future. Um, and then in the summer, including coming up, uh, the first week of September this year, we have Kudzu Vine Camp, which is using the vines and the leaves for lots of their edible and craft yields. Um, and so that's another we call it an, an experimental Skillshare. Mm-hmm. So it's not it's a it's a by donation workshop, um, really informal, but we're teaching some and doing a lot of hands on use and harvesting and processing of kudzu. It's a lot of fun. So that's something that people can come and check out uh, kudzuculture.net if you want to learn more about that. Um, and yeah, that's an ex- it's a great example of permaculture of what we're trying to grow is kudzu culture, a culture of understanding the physical details of how to use it, how to manage it in the landscape. It's also, by the way, one of the most climate resilient food sources in terms of future intense droughts and stuff because of its huge roots. Um, not only those things, but how to have a culture of enjoyment and transmission of knowledge around it and get together to do it together communally. Kudzu leaf tamales. Kudzu, yeah, we, last summer we made kudzu leaf tamales, exactly. We wrapped the tamales in kudzu leaves. They were beautiful <laughs> and delicious. Yeah. And we had the endorsement of uh, a, a Mexican national. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> okay. For doing it. Um, so uh, we're, we're kind of running out of time oh. here. Um, Having so much fun. Yeah, uh, maybe we can continue this conversation again Later. sometime. Yeah. But in the meantime, uh, how can people get involved in what you're doing? Uh, how, where would they get in touch with you? Um, Web pages? Yeah. Email addresses? Go ahead. Um, I have a website called seedsofregeneration.com. 
So that's S E E D S of regeneration.com. And you can find me there, my email address, and my newsletter, and all the things I'm up to, and all my events on that place. Great. And I'm and living, living systems design.net is my permaculture design and consulting business along with Chuck Marsh he's one of the founders of Earth Haven Eco Village who still lives there and then also uh, school of integrated living dot org which is our educational institution at Earth Haven okay. yeah. yeah well Courtney and Jeff thank you so much for coming on news from the roots yeah and uh, for us. maybe for we'll us, see Dad. you again for an update sometime soon and uh, maybe uh and and the kudzu work page is September. Do you know the exact date? September first through third. First through first third. Third. And, yeah. And they can contact you through Living Systems Design. They or? can, but better through kudzuculture.net. Kudzuculture.net. Yeah. And that's a great. So it's a three-day workshop. Is there there's a, a sliding scale? Yeah, just sliding scale by donation. People take turns cooking meals for each other, so we've really cut the costs down to try to just meet, get everybody who wants to come be able to participate. So if you want to learn how to yeah. use kudzu and have a lot of fun doing so with a lot of yeah. other people who want to do the same thing, um, you can go there and, and uh, join that effort. Oh, we should also speak to uh, Earth Haven's website, Earth Haven Eco Village, if you want to learn more about that. And there are tours every other Saturday then um, go to earthhaven.org with one H, earthhaven.org. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks, Thanks Dad. Thank All you. Right. <laughs>